Any of those 400 people that were in that room will remember the screaming match between me and the folks up on that stage. And we walked out of there and said, we're going to do things differently. That's Mike Papantonio, legendary trial attorney, television and radio host, best-selling author, progressive activist, and senior partner at Levin Papantonio. I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp Video, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I've built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. I sat down with Mike Papantonio to explore how he shook up the mass torts industry and why some attorneys are their own worst enemies. A trial lawyer that doesn't have anger in them, that doesn't have a bit of anger that they can call on when they need to call on it that they can go from zero to 100 in two seconds. If they don't have that, it's evident in their role as a trial lawyer, and it's evident in their role is in the bigger community of lawyering. That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Mike Papantonio is known as America's lawyer. He's won a number of multi-million dollar verdicts that have earned him a place in the National Trial Lawyers Hall of Fame. But what really sets him apart is his ability to tell a story. Pap's been broadcasting to the masses on his radio show, Ring of Fire, for over 15 years. He's also written multiple best-selling books and anchored the internationally acclaimed television show, America's Lawyer. But to better understand his knack for storytelling, you must first understand Mike Papantonio. A lot of people don't know this, but uh, John and Morgan and I used to be roommates at University of Florida. So John and I have always been in touch. We've always taken the time for him to say to me, Pap, what are you up to? And I've always said, John, what are you up to? So that's the first step is having somebody that you're able to talk to and be a little creative with. And I, I think it just, it lends itself to kind of an expansion of, of vision. So when this started out, when the whole idea of doing something a little unusual, where it came to marketing or simply branding, let's, let's call it branding, I just realized that everybody was doing the same thing. Everybody was, you know, they had the, the same approach to television, they had the same approach to, uh, to billboards, whatever it may have been. And so my theory has always been to move outside that circle and color outside the lines. And what I understood right off the bat was to move into a space where nobody was there. It's kind of like Babe Ruth. When they asked Babe Ruth, how have you hit so many home runs? Babe Ruth said, well, I just hit them where they ain't. And so that's where I think uh, myself, and I know that's where John's always tried to head, go where, there, go, go where there's not a lot of uh, occupied space. And so in doing that, it started off with immediately with a radio program. Matter of fact, the studio that I'm in right now is one of the first studios we built here at the law firm. It's a, it's a radio studio, fairly sophisticated, but we started off doing a radio show that became an important element to, to who we are. It's called Ring of Fire. Bobby Kennedy and I started it initially, and then um, Sam Cedar, who you know, well-known actor, he came on and w was involved with it. To this day, is still involved with Ring of Fire. But what we were trying to do is say this. Sometimes you have to, um, if you want to expand what you're doing as a lawyer, you have to talk about things besides being a lawyer. Uh, we spent a lot of time in the early days of uh, Ring of Fire talking about social issues that tied right into what we were doing for a living, but we didn't, we didn't address it as a lawyer issue. We, we addressed it as bigger issues, as kind of bigger visionary issues, the haves versus the have-nots, the influence of corporate America in, uh, to the average consumer, 
How does it affect quality of life? How can we do better? The issues of environment. How are we affected by the conduct of corporations in the environment? How are we affected by the conduct of corporations where it comes to our safety? So all of a sudden, those discussions became kind of our brand. That brand is still goes on today with America's Lawyer, which is a program, it's an international program. It shows all over the world. Uh, it's on a, on a network that's actually bigger than BBC. It's RT, it's called RT International. So we started with the notion of let's not brand ourselves uniquely as, you know, the same kind of animal, the same kind of lawyer. Let's brand ourselves as, as a lawyer that has some, that has a sense of social responsibility because we really do. That's who we really are. You can't sell something that's not genuine. And so that's kind of where it started. And from there, it just year after year, it just became more and more the brand and became more and more of a feature of who we are as a law firm. So let, let me ask if, if I may, was there an event that perhaps earlier in your life, maybe perhaps during your childhood that you believe influenced a lot of the ways in which you make decisions today, uh, what you stand for and so on, because it seems like that has continually expanded year over year. But I'm curious as if we get to the root of it, was there something that took place that perhaps led to you becoming an attorney or do you feel that was always in the cards? My background, I don't know what you know about it, but I was raised by eight different families all over Florida. When you're raised like that, there's a lot of things that happen. First of all, the people that raised me for the most part, those eight different families, they were blue collar worker. They were probably the very bottom of the rung from the socioeconomic standpoint of you know, how they uh, line up there. But they were decent people. They were decent people that took me into their home. They didn't have to. I was not on a, uh, it wasn't an HRS kind of situation. I was not part of a children's program. It was simply, I would live with a family for a year, two years, then move to another family. But these were people that were so decent to take a kid in that you know literally had no place to live, that you're molded by that, you're, you're moved by that, and all of a sudden that becomes who you are. You love to take on bullies because these are people that were, for the most part, often bullied. They were often at a huge disadvantage socioeconomically. That can't do anything except change you. That's why many times uh, I, I think people sometimes see me as a bit of a radical, and I, and I am, I always have been. I've, I've always been way to the left. So that, that comes out of your, your desire to take care of those people who help formulate who you are. I mean, in there, it was a very positive experience. I learned, uh, I became a musician, playing guitar, saxophone, uh, piano. I became an artist, oil painting artist. Uh, I became a writer, I became a pilot. All of these things they gave me, they made who I am. So, you know, that's what shaped me very early on. And if you were to go back and you were to ask, say, uh, say John, my, my friend John, if you were to ask Morgan, what shaped you? I wrote, a, I remember writing a, um, a preface to the first book that John wrote. My point to the preface was we are shaped by that childhood. We become that person from that childhood. And some people react different ways. Some people say, well, it's, it's had a negative impact. Uh, I can't rise above it. Some people say, let me embrace it and make it a positive. And I think most of the people that you've interviewed on this program, you would find a similar kind of story with a lot of them, not all of them, but with a lot of them. And so I think that's been an important part of uh, what's made me who I am. And it's, it's genuine. There's no, there's no affectation here, Mike. What you see is what you get. Whether I'm on television in an attack mode, whether I'm in trial in an attack mode and deposition in attack mode, that's who I am. And I always tell every trial lawyer, a trial lawyer that doesn't have anger in them, that doesn't have a bit of anger that they can call on when they need to call on it, that they can go from zero to 100 in two seconds. If they don't have that, it's evident in their role as a trial lawyer, and it's evident in their role is in the bigger community of lawyering. Some people view their upbringing as an obstacle that can't be overcome, but Pap sees his upbringing as the catalyst that helped fuel his ferocity in the courtroom. There's no denying his monumental success, but he didn't get where he is today by treading lightly. Progress is made by those who are willing to disrupt the status quo, and that's exactly what he did. I've never been a class action lawyer. I've always been a trial lawyer. 
I'll never forget the moment. We were in Atlanta and the breast implant litigation had just, had just taken off, right? And so because I had done asbestos litigation before then, I had co-counsel all over the country that were selling me, sending me their breast implant cases. And so I remember these old guys up on a stage. I won't name the names, but most people who remember this era knew who they were. So I got these old guys on the stage. There's 400 people. We're in Atlanta at some big hotel. And they're telling me what they're going to do with my cases because they're class action lawyers. They were mass tort lawyers who were terrible mass tort lawyers who never really were there for the consumer. They were there for themselves. They were there to make big fees and then move on. And I remember the arrogance and the audacity of this character standing up on the stage telling me what I was going to do with my cases and how he was going to handle it. I remember grabbing the mic. I was a kid. <laughs> I was a kid. But I remember grabbing the mic and saying, Mr. I don't even know who you are, but it's not going to be anything that you're going to be involved with my cases. There's not going to be a time where you make a decision for me as a trial lawyer what I'm going to do with my cases. I'm telling you, it was that year and that moment where I decided that I wanted to build out a new reality in the area of trial law. I wanted mass tort lawyers not to be class action lawyers. I wanted mass tort lawyers that wanted to be able to try their own cases and, and do what a trial lawyer should do and get top dollar for their clients and make it about the client, not about them. We came out of that room and we said, there's got, we have to make a shift here. And those days are gone. And they were gone all the way right after the breast implant litigation. Nothing was ever the same. And so out of that came the building of uh, Mass Towards Made Perfect and the whole notion of putting together talented trial lawyers, talented marketers, talented business minds, talented visionaries, all in one room and say, how do we continue this notion of taking care of a consumer in a way that's never been done before to where people don't look at us and say, yeah, Mike, you made a big fee, but how much did your... How did you do for your client? Those days are totally gone. And every now and then we have to push back. Every now and then they try to reemerge and we have to push back. Actually, we're at one of those junctions right now where I feel like I'm having to push back more than I ever have. But that's okay. It's, it's, an, ongoing, it's an ongoing element of, of who we are and what we do. So that was a really decisive shift in the practice of law. And any of those 400 people that were in that room will remember the screaming match between me and the folks up on that stage. And we walked out of there and said, we're going to do things differently. So it seems like a lot of these new initiatives arrive out of like a dissatisfaction with the status quo. And when we talk about, let's say, mass torts made perfect. Now, this is arguably become probably one of the largest legal events in the entire legal industry. So it seems like when you get involved with something, you're not dipping your toe in the water, you're going all in. But how do you find the balance of being able to expand in something new, you know, whether it's a TV show, radio show, a book, the event company, because these are not small initiatives. First of all, you have, to, uh, you have to be willing to jump in. And fear of rejection, Michael, is a very dangerous thing. When I was coming up as, as a kid, one way I paid for college, for example, again, <laughs> ask John Morgan about the days that I would come home after being on the, selling books during the summer, and John and I were roommates, <laughs> and I would drive home having made $30,000, right, in college. And the point being is that taught me, that taught me a lot. It taught me a door-to-door -door selling. You can't be afraid of rejection. You've got to, in, you have to embrace rejection. You have to say, I'm not afraid that somebody is going to be critical of what I do. I'm not afraid of failure. I'm not, a, I'm not fearful of rejection. Mike, I got to tell you something. I did one time uh, early on as a young lawyer, I wrote a book. It was called uh, In Search of Atticus Finch. And to do the book, I did a, a series of questionnaires that I sent out all over the country. The re response was remarkable. I mean, the turnaround was remarkable. The response was remarkable. And then I had, I had some really good shrinks look at this seven to eight page of questionnaires. And I asked, if I want to talk about something, if I want to talk about what it is that lawyers need to improve, you know what, you know what it came up with? It came up with the fear of rejection. 
the fear of saying, I can try something new, I might fail, but if I fail, you know what, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to get it right the next time. So I, I've always been impressed with that because you would think lawyers would it be just, just the opposite. Now, I guess if I were to really analyze it and I were to break it down, you'd find trial lawyers, people who are in trial all the time, obviously they can't be very rejection. But the guy that's out there, the one girl that's out there with a typical kind of practice and they're just doing what's been handed down to them. My, the generation before me did it. I have to do it the same way. Mary down the street is doing it like that. Therefore, I have to do it the same way. It is so destructive. It is just remarkably destructive. People get too comfortable. You know, they're, they're doing the same thing the same way. They, you know, I'm handling these comp cases. I'm making a pretty good living. I'm handling this auto case. I'm handling... But what does it really do for your need to brand and your need to expand? How are you different than anyone else? Unless you say, well, let me take at least a chance on one of these. Let me do a project um, on Zantac. Let me do a project on, uh, on uh, human trafficking. You see, those are the lawyers, when you look at their history, they've had a consistent history of not being fearful of rejection. They've done different things. They've tried to do it a different way. And I keep coming back to the early days of, you know, when John and I were young lawyers. This is what we would talk about all the time, man. What are we doing that's different from everybody else? And so John goes on and he builds this incredible organization throughout uh, America. Uh, you mentioned Shannara was on this program. Same kind of thinker, you see. Same kind of thinker. So... I think that that's had a big impact on me is saying, I can't be afraid of rejection. I can't be afraid of people saying, gee, Pap, you know, what are you trying to do here? <laughs> this, this is really overreaching. I'm, I'm just not fearful of that. Mike Papantonio has pushed the boundaries and challenged the status quo time and time again. But often when you're innovative, it takes people out of their comfort zone. And Pap's no stranger to that. I'm never dumbfounded by people that sit there and say, I, I can't do that. I build it into what I'm saying. I know that if I'm in a room of 1,500 people, there'll be, there'll be 100 that get it. And those 100 will jump into a project and it'll change the... Do, do, you remember, do you remember the controversy about opioids? I don't know if you remember when we built opioids. You were there. When I was trying to launch opioids, do you realize how much resistance there was in that room? I don't know if you were up there, but there was a panel. It was me arguing with Joe Rice and some other class action folks about how they had it wrong. And my argument was, why are we representing attorney generals? Why don't we represent cities and counties? And I said to everybody in that room, go get cities and counties, cause at the end, it's probably gonna go okay. Other side of it, oh, no, 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 don't get cities. Well, I don't care what that opinion is. Or how about the whole notion of how to build this out in an MDL, you see? How do you create an MDL? How do you bring everybody under the same umbrella and move this thing ahead? It was the only way to do it, you understand? When we built out opioids, distributors weren't on anybody's radar. It was some young lawyer in West Virginia, Paul Farrell, who's a brilliant young lawyer, who had called me and said, Pap, I need help. I need help trying these cases. I need help building this out. And I said, sure, let's go. But if you were in that room and you saw the kind of flat earth thinking that was in that room, and you came away and said, what, what in the hell just happened? Why don't people see this? And the people who got in, the people who listened are going to do very well. Just like I could, go down the, I could go down the list of things like that, all the way back to tobacco, where we're telling people, or I can't tell you how many projects where I say, this is the one, get involved on this one, all the way out to C8, when we're talking about C8, and we're talking about this is a toxin that's giving people cancer all over the globe. Go do this. Go do it. And some people have the guts and they have the vision and they've got the character to say, yeah, I think I can do this. I want to do something differently. I want to associate with this law firm to help because I can't do it alone. I want to build a new relationship with these people. Even that 
If you follow the trail on that, Michael, even that simple notion. Now, here you got lawyers that are at home during the COVID crisis. Why would they not pick up the telephone and talk to people that they've never met? Say, Joe, I know you're a lawyer in Kansas. I have a similar practice that you have. Why don't we work together? or whatever, or I, I want to get involved in this project. I hear that y'all are doing Zantac. Why don't I get, why don't you make a telephone call? Call me, call the people do, doing Zantac and say, I want to get involved. Why don't they do that? Because it comes back to that basic thing that I'm talking to you about that is, is like a burden around our neck. It's fear of rejection. When I was a young lawyer, I had two pads on my, I would keep them out on my desk every day. One pad over here is a people, a list of people that I don't know, but I would like to meet because they've done interesting things. And I would randomly call them. Just give them a call. Mary, how you doing? I, I hear you're, I, I hear you're undertaking a new environmental project. Let's talk about it. Well, you know, either Mary's a jerk. She doesn't want to talk to me. That's fine or Mary understands that it's helpful to have alliances. So I would go down this list every week and I would make 10 calls every week. Over here is another list. That other list is co-counsel that I already work with. And I would call them and I would talk to them about ideas that I would just kick around. I, sometimes I did it at night. Sometimes I, I, I make calls until 10 o'clock at night because that's the only time you could find them. So you'll find that same pattern with other people you've talked to that you feel like you want to interview. They just jump in, man. They just jump in. Sometimes they fall fat, flat on their face, but most of the time they're not going to. It's law of averages, you see. If I make 10 phone calls like that to people I don't even know, they, don't, they may hate me, I don't know, but I still do it and I still call them and I say, you know, Terry, uh, I hear you're, you know, you're trying to build a mass tort business and we see out at, at mass torts made perfect. Come on and let's work on a project together. What's the harm there? What's the harm other than him saying, well, no. Okay, fine. <laughs> You're lost, not mine. I'm guessing that when Mike Papantonio gives someone a call today, they answer on the first ring. But what if you're not Mike Papantonio? Forge ahead, forge ahead. I can't even count the number of young lawyers that I had no idea who they were, no idea who call me and say, you know, I saw you, I heard you, whatever. Can I work with you? Now, am I going to be such a schmuck that I'm not going to help that young lawyer that wants to be helped? Don't deal with people like that. If that young lawyer gets a response like that, move on. Just keep moving on, build relationships. They're lifetime relationships and they'll carry you through your entire career. But relationships matter, especially meaningful relationships. That, you talk about marketing, we're somewhat of an advertiser, but nothing like some of the folks that you, that you deal with. Most of our stuff is because they come out of relationships. They come out of co-counsel relationships that we started, that I started building all the way back to the asbestos days. I was going to trial five, six times a year with huge asbestos cases. Out of there, I had co-counsel relationships I, bu I built. And so there's no better way to build a practice than that. Now, one of the things you mentioned to me early on, even before we got started, you mentioned the word brand. And sometimes I think, you know, attorneys hear brand and say, well, that sounds nice, but I can't really measure it. Why do you believe building a brand is so important? Well, you can measure it, actually. Building a brand is not one thing. You want to hear my brand right now? Documentaries that have been done on projects that we do. Television programs that I've been involved with for 18 years. Uh, relationships with individuals that have been developed for a very long time. The idea of being willing to do more for the other guy than they do for you. This is a very difficult thing for people to get their arms around. My lawyers know this. If I ever find that you haven't treated somebody right, that, you, that somebody that's worked with us does not come away with exactly where they think they should be, I tell my lawyers, leave money on the table 
take it away from yourself before you take it. Always do more from the other guy. That is actually part of our brand. And I think if you asked around people, you know, never been sued in, in uh, this law firm is 66 years old. I've been here for 37 years. You realize we've never had a lawsuit about fees ever. If there was even the suggestion of it, what we would do is say, well, let's work it out. That's part of a brand. The, the, the notion of um, being out there with new ideas is a brand. The radio message that we did for years, that was part of a brand. The idea of taking on things that are outside the norm, that's part of a brand. But all of these things converge and there's no one thing. You don't brand yourself simply with TV advertisement. It's important. Without TV advertisement, Michael, how do people know that they've, you know, that there's a product out there that's going to shut down their liver or cause them to have a stroke? How do they know that? Okay, so that's one part of it. But if you're dealing with a lawyer and they're coming to you and they say, Michael, I want you to help brand me. What you have to say is, well, we can't do that with just advertising. The brand has to be a comprehensive picture of what it is that you really stand for. What is that mission statement? And I, so in describing our mission statement, it is to, to work outside of the norms, to try to do things. Whether it's right now we're launching human trafficking. I'm telling you up, up front, by the time the project is years down the road, it'll be one of the biggest projects in the country it's part of our brand is to always be on the cutting edge. And sometimes the cutting edge is a difficult place to hold on to. It's difficult because you're always trying to, you're trying to figure out issues that there's no template for it. I mean, how, how did we build out opioids? How did we build out tobacco? It started right here in this law firm, you understand, right here in this law firm. How did we build out tobacco without having any template to do it? Well, it's kind of like walking through a dark room and reaching out and trying to touch a wall. It's not comfortable. You, you wake up at night and, you know, you say, well, what's my next move? It's not comfortable, but it keeps you sharp as an attorney. It keeps you sharp as a person. It makes you better. It makes you better all the way around. You're not, you're building a legacy and the legacy is more than what's been handed down to you. Your legacy is I saved a river. You know, I, I changed the way this corporation is throwing toxins into a river. I pulled 38, 38 pharmaceuticals off the market because they were, they were hurting people. I got black box warnings on 20 pharmaceuticals. I closed down Wall Street when they were stealing money from mom and pop. I, I did something about that. And then to me, I always think about it. I've got a daughter that's going to be trying cases with me. And when she says, well, dad, what did you do? I love talking about that. I like to say, well, this is the legacy that I hope that we leave. This is the brand I hope we leave, coming back to that word brand. Your brand is your legacy. So let's talk about the books because you could have stopped with the trial practice and MTMP and so on, but the, the books themselves, the fiction books, that, that's, and they're actually very good for law and disorder, law and vengeance, law and addiction. What was the impetus to, to writing those, especially in a fiction thriller format? Yeah, so uh, I've done media for so many years. Early on, I realized that the stories that we create as lawyers in what we do day to day, the media does a terrible job handling. If you get a story for 24 hours, that's extraordinary. You could have 2,000 people dying and some cat, some advertiser is telling production at MSNBC, don't let Pap do that story. If you do, we're going to pull our advertising. I can tell you straight up, Joe Scarborough used to be my law partner. I don't know if you know that or not, but Joe Scarborough left this, left this law firm. We helped him leave. We helped him get his job in New York because he was a better, he's better on television than he was as a lawyer. The point being, I was on his show one time and I was talking about a product that was arsenic laced wood, okay? The level of arsenic was ridiculously high. It was off the charts. And this company was using this arsenic laced wood to make children's playground equipment. Now, right off the bat, sounded like it was, <laughs> there was a problem with that. So I, we start initiating a case. I'm on MSNBC and I'm telling the story. I'm showing the documents, I'm doing all this. The next day I get a call from Joe Scarborough saying, oh, my pap, you, pap, you've got to come back on and apologize. And 
the, this little freak, uh, Phil Griffin, who uh, runs MSNBC, you got to come back on. Apo-. I said, I know I'm not going to come back on and apologize. I'm going to tell our stories. OK, well, here's the point. The advertiser for that company put pressure on leadership, right? So how do we tell stories unless we can move outside the realm of corporate media? Corporate media is a abysmal disaster. OK, that's why I started doing America's Lawyer. It's not typical corporate media. In five years doing this international program, not one time have they said, you can't do that story, Mike. You can't do that story. I don't care if I'm going after DuPont, Bear. It doesn't make any difference. Whoever I'm, Monsanto, whoever I'm going after, all they want, tell the truth, get it right. Corporate media is a disaster. They're dead. So what do I do with these fiction books? I tell stories that are real stories. Now, they're fictionalized somewhat. You got to have them turn the pages. But at the same time, they're, they're true events. These events actually happen. The stories are true. The conduct of the corporations, it's all true. And so this was just another avenue for me to tell stories, just like radio that we started out with, right? Television that I moved to next. It was a way to tell stories. M- MTMP's way to tell stories. The National Trial Lawyers Association that we own uh, half of, that's another way to tell these stories and keep them out there. But the point is this, we have great stories. We just have a corporate media who doesn't want to hear them because their advertisers don't want them told. If you're working in an environment with, say, corporate media where you can't tell those stories, what do you accomplish, right? What do you really accomplish? So that's what I'm talking about where, when I talk about why the books were written. First of all, I was a journalism major at University of Florida. I love to write. I write all the time, regardless of whether I'm writing books or whatever. Those, those books now, think about this. Those books now are going to become a screenplay that's being worked on right now by some folks that have had huge success in screenplays. The name of the, the, name of the series is called Deke, which is a character in the book. That'll be a screenplay. Hopefully those stories will be told again. So when you create energy, whether it's a book, whether it's a TV element, whether it's radio element, whether whatever it is, when you create energy, something comes out of it. For example, the C8 case that, we, that I handled up in Ohio that went on for several years, settled the case for the entire Ohio River Valley. A documentary came out called The Devil We Know. It was the number one documentary for Netflix. There'll be another documentary that comes out in a matter of months. It's about the opioid crisis. Same caliber of people. Matter of fact, the people who, uh, who did Tiger King are the same people who did this documentary that's going to be coming out in a couple of months. So out of that comes energy, right? I could go and I could give a speech to 100 people and the issue dis- disappears. Or I could put it in the documentary where it's going to be seen again and again and again and people are going to get it that these people we were dealing with, that there was a level of criminality that was just off the charts. Now, Mike, throughout your career, it seems like you've been very outspoken. You've taken a stand for the things that you believe in. But have there been times when you look back and say, you know, either you weren't so sure of of what you were about to say or perhaps moments of regret or things you'd want to change the outcome of just looking back in hindsight? Well, I don't, I don't know. There's any moments of regret. <laughs> There's been times when I, when I would step back after doing a TV show and say, oh my God, I can't believe I said that. Yeah, there have been those times. Most of the time that's been political. People are always trying to figure out where I am on the political spectrum. I'm not Democrat. I'm not Republican. I call balls and strikes. Uh, right now, I think as heavily as I've been critical of the Republicans over the decades and decades, I'm now that critical of Democrats for a reason. I want, I want him to listen and say, well, we can do better. But you look at this leadership and you go, well, maybe not. So yeah, there are times when I, when I, I just get, I feel like I have to say something. There was one time with, uh, I, I went on, I was talking about uh, something involving the opioid crisis. And I, you know, the judge calls me in and says, you can't do that. Well, you know, that was pretty uncomfortable, right? But what I said had to be said. And what I, what I felt, I couldn't just cover up and act like it was unimportant. So, yeah, there's been plenty of OMG moments where I walk away and I said, uh, maybe I shouldn't have gone that far. But sometimes you have to. 
Now, there's a saying that you don't become successful by what you do. Sometimes you become successful by what you do consistently. And I'm curious if over the years, everything from the radio show to the conferences to the books, I mean, if if you had to look back and say how many even media appearances you've done, how many interviews have you done? I mean, it's got to be thousands at this point. Uh, It is. It definitely is. Yeah. So when you look back at that, I imagine that when you started off the radio show, for example, it probably wasn't getting the the amount of listeners that that it is today. What are your thoughts in terms of the consistency? Because someone's listening might think, hey, I would like to do a radio show or a podcast or just whatever platform. Okay, Michael, let let me give you the best example I can. I'm here looking at you, talking to you. This is being filmed in this studio, and this is going to be all over the Internet. In the very earliest days of Mass Torts Made Perfect, I remember making several speeches about You had a thousand people in a room and I would say, you know what you should do if you want exposure, do a radio show. That was before podcasts even. And then podcasts came along. I said, do a podcast. And then they had ability to do local television. I said, do local television. The first local TV show I ever had was something called Lawline. It was right here in Pensacola. And I I just tried to connect with the community. The show went on for 20 years, okay? And it was so simple. It was so inexpensive, but it was so valuable. So there again, Michael, you're doing it, right? You're doing it, and the success of what you're doing will continue to grow because you have a vision of what you're trying to accomplish. When you can't take that vision and put it in somebody's head, it dies. But I remember coming out of those early, those early speeches where I'd said, you got to do something, man. You, you got you to start a radio show, a local TV show. Some people got it, and they're still doing it today, and they're still doing well today. But most of the time, if you look at those people, it's simple, a small reflection of the totality of who they are, you see. The radio show is just a small part. The TV show is just a small part. If you look at how they've built their entire practice It all looks creative. It all looks visionary. It all looks progressive. It all looks like something different than the cat down the road who's 1-800, give me a call for any accident. Okay? It's just different. How do you juggle everything that you're involved in? Just on a day-to-day basis, I'm curious. Well, you have to plan really well. I've got a pretty good time schedule. I've got a staff that keeps me um, just... You've met Scott Milliken, for example. Scott's been with me for 19 years. He started as a kid here. He, along with uh, half a dozen other staff members, just do that for me. They, they, they say, okay, you got to be here. You got to get this done. And I think the routine and the discipline of that comes, I'd like to say it's just my own discipline, but it's not. It's people that you surround yourself with who, says, who say to you, you know, this is important, Bab. Get out there and get this done. You, you got to have that. And so I know when I'm going to write. I know my schedule exactly what my writing schedule is. It starts Friday morning and goes sometimes up to the wee wee hours of the morning on Sunday. I know when I'm getting ready for MTMP. I know what I have to do to get ready for a TV hit. And so it's, it's taking that time and then saying in there, and here's the most important thing I can tell you, is in there preserving your quality of life. Because you got children you have to raise. You have spouses that, that matter, and they have to see that you're part of all that. You're, you have to change hats. Today, okay, I'm in the office today, I'm lawyering. I'm in a deposition, and I'm, you know, it's a bloodbath deposition. I'm beating the bejesus out of this witness. But then I have to walk out of there, and I got to change hats. I got to go home, right? I got to have a quality of life. And the same thing holds true whether it's television, you got to walk away and it becomes a routine. It becomes a way of life. It's like a habit. And you, the main thing is support yourself with people who help support what you're trying to accomplish that are similar to you. You know, they have the same vision of what you're trying to accomplish. And I, I fortunately have just been absolutely blessed with that. Uh, the people that I, that I surround myself have just, they're just superstars. Mike Papantonio could have ridden off into the sunset a long time ago. I wondered, what continues to keep him engaged and pressing forward? I think some of the stuff that that hopefully that we do around here matters. Um, When I talk about this notion of legacy, you realize until we went to trial, the the thing that comes to my mind right off the bat, until we pushed the tobacco industry into a corner, 
nothing was going to change until we pushed the opioid industry into the corner. Nothing was going to change. Until I took on DuPont up in the Ohio River Valley, they would still be dumping C8 into those waterways, killing people. So you say to yourself, okay, if I didn't do that, would anybody else have done it? In each one of those cases, the answer was no, they would not have. And so it's easy for me to stay motivated. And I love to see, um, I love working with, with young lawyers. Uh, some of the talent I'm seeing coming up right now, you know, everybody's down on millennials and, oh, gee, they just don't work hard enough. And, you know, they got this weird schedule. No, millennials want the same thing you want. You know, you just, they got to tweak it a little bit. But when they get into doing what we do around this place, they're motivated. You know, they, their, their victory is that they cleaned up an uh, entire ecosystem. You know, the young lawyers from our law firm that handled the BP case along this coast where their entire, entire ecosystem was destroyed. Uh, Brian Barr, when he got involved with that, was a young, fairly young lawyer. He had not handled huge projects like that, but he handled that project and did an extraordinary job. So I love to see that. I love to see uh, these younger lawyers coming in and buying into the idea that what they do really matters buying into the idea that hopefully when it's all over, they can leave a legacy that they can sit down with their grandkids and the grandchild says, what did you do, daddy, as a lawyer? Well, let me go down the list for you. And as we come to a close, this being the Game Changing Attorney podcast, Mike, what does being a game changer mean to you? It means always trying to wake up with another idea and never saying I've done enough and never, never saying, oh, okay, I'm comfortable. Being too comfortable is a very dangerous thing. I want to give a huge thank you to Mike Papantonio for joining us today. You've been listening to the Game Changing Attorney Podcast with me, Michael Mogul. And join us next time when we'll be speaking to the founder of Michigan's largest personal injury firm, Mike Morse, about his new book, Fireproof, and how to take your law firm from unpredictable to wildly profitable. Three o'clock in the morning, I got a call that my office was on fire and I hopped in the car I sped to my office and I saw the fire trucks there and my secretary was there and we stood there and we cried and that was devastating. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you could share it with at least one ambitious law firm owner that you think would benefit. For more information on our interview with Mike Papantonio, see the show notes for this episode in your podcast app or visit gamechangingattorney.com. Oh, 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 o